I first want to acknowledge a couple people. Um, two of my very dear friends, Jeannie and Stephanie, are in the audience. They came down from the Baltimore, Washington area. They were in my congregation in Maryland. Thank you for being here today. <laughs> I married them in, in 2013, so, and they're still going strong. And I also want to echo what John said, that I'm stepping away from the leadership here, but I love this center so much. And I am so incredibly grateful to Dr. John and Dr. Barbara for making a place for me. Thank you, because not every minister would do that. And you've totally let me do my thing here, and I'm just incredibly grateful for that, so thank you very much. And as Dr. John said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be here as a member. Um, I'll be filling in as a guest speaker every now and then. But you know when spirit tells you it's time to move on? Anyone ever get that little urge? <laughs> and what I've learned is that I'm here to listen, to lean in and listen. And that spiritual maturity is in direct correlation with how well we listen and take action. Because I can say I've listened for many years and did nothing. Anyone else with me on that? <laughs> and I've learned that when I hear the urge, when I, I'm given that divine direction, I know that I have to take the steps to make that happen. So my talk today is about the change that we go through when we do this. And so change is inevitable, suffering is optional is my title. Would you agree with that statement? Yes. It's been around for a while, I love it. And do you remember the brick cell phone that we all used to carry then? When that was like the thing. Uh, Zach Morris of Saved by the Bell from those who love uh, the 80s. Do you remember the older phone than that? You actually had to like dial the phone. And there's still so many of us that will sometimes make that, <laughs> that uh, movement. And then how many of you had the television where you literally had to get up and walk to the television <laughs> to change the channels? <laughs> there were only three or four at that time. <laughs> but you had to get up and move to, and the rabbit ears. Yes. Remember putting the tin foil on the rabbit ears? And last but not least, remember the 8-track. <laughs> oh my goodness, does that take me back. Uh, listening to 8-track cassettes in the car. And they always, always eventually would get the, the, the tape would break or the tape would get caught in there. And so we've all seen this technology. Do we miss any of it? because it's gone on to something better, right? There's something better that has evolved from all of this. And if we know anything about technology, we know that it's gonna continue to change. It's going to continue to wow us with, oh my gosh, we don't even need cash anymore. <laughs> we don't need money anymore. There's all kinds of things that are on the horizon for us. And so change is inevitable. And the point is that sometimes when these things change, we get a little verklempt about it because we don't want it to happen. And yet, ultimately, there is a higher good that is evolving for us if we simply trust and lean into that. That's where our suffering comes from, isn't it? When we're holding on to something so dearly that we can't let go because we're just afraid of what might be next. How could it be any better than 8-track, we say to ourselves. <laughs> and yet, if we simply allowed ourselves to know that the, the highest good is always evolving, do you believe that with me? Yes. The highest good is always evolving. This is a chance for us to really trust. The dragonfly is one of my symbols, I, and I'm wearing one of my favorite pins today because of that. It's an ancient symbol of transformation. And I, like, I liken that to 
Are we willing to roll with the changes that come into our lives? Because we're always transforming, right? You're not the same person that walked in here 15 minutes ago. You're already a different person. But the, the, the dragonfly has a, a fabulous story. It starts out underwater. The egg actually is laid in the water, and then it turns into what they call the nymph. The nymph can live under the water anywhere from a few months to five years. To five years. Eventually, it has this instinct that tells it, you need to go up. <laughs> you need to go above the water. And so it, it actually finds a reed or grass, something that's sticking up out of the water to crawl up, and it literally will start by sticking just its head out of the water where it learns how to breathe. Because before it's been using a gill-like way to breathe, now it has to figure out how to do air. Talk about a change. So it, it takes a few hours and it figures out, okay, I can breathe, I can breathe this air, and then it walks up this, whoops, go back. It walks up the rod here and it, it knows that it has to further evolve. And the, the, the weakest part of the hard casing that this nymph is in is right behind its head. And it splits there when it, when it is in the air. And then the dragonfly has to literally pull itself out of the casing. Now, that doesn't look very easy, does it? <laughs> Every part of nature is always shedding, is always moving into something new. The snake knows that it has to shed its skin. Even lobsters. When lobsters grow, they have the hard shell encasing it, but eventually they outgrow that shell, the soft, fleshy part that we like to eat, uh, outgrows that shell, and they have to shed the shell and then go find a safe place to hide because it doesn't have any protection until it grows a new shell. Every form of nature knows instinctively, I've got to move on to something greater. Man is the only species that has the freedom of will, the freedom of choice, to know that they have to move on to something and still stick with the old skin. Can I get an amen to that? <laughs> There's a couple of us that maybe hung out with some old dead skin for a long time. We knew we had to shed it, <laughs> but we weren't quite ready to do so. Man is the only species that ignores that instinct that, that actually will suffer as a result of the change it's going through. This doesn't look like a lot of fun, but the dragonfly knows there's a purpose here. There's a greater intention. And so eventually, as it pulls out of this casing, it becomes this beautiful dragonfly where it can live usually just another couple of months. So when we see these things going on and we are intuitively going, I've got to move on to something. I've, this relationship is no longer serving me. This job is no longer serving me. Whatever the, the situation is, we always have that instinctual knowing, don't we, that is telling us maybe it's time to spread our wings a little bit. Maybe it's time to move on. And yet, when we're holding on, that indeed is the suffering. It's the trust, it's the letting go that allows us to move through momentary, momentary, momentary change to get to the other side. So I know that as I'm going through whatever metamorphosis I'm going through, I trust. I trust this process. Viktor Frankl said this, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Now that man knew what he was talking about. Living in the, the concentration camps in World War II, he could not change the condition he was in, but he was determined not to let anybody take the one thing that they could not take, and that was his free will of having a peaceful mind. No one could take that from him. Despite the horrors that he was living around and living in, he made that choice. This is Nickajack Cave 
It's in Tennessee. It's flooded now because of a dam that they built. The Tennessee Valley Authority built it in, in, 19, uh, in the 1970s. But it used to not be flooded before they built the dam. And in 1968, a man walked into Nickajack Cave. He had explored those caves when he was a boy. He knew that the caves went on for miles and miles down inside the earth. And he walked in because at that moment, he was a broken man. He was broken spiritually, physically, emotionally. Years of drug abuse had ravaged his body, and he just didn't want to live any longer. So it was his intention when he walked in to the cave to walk as far as he could, lay down, and die. That's what he was going to do. He actually did that. He walked way down into the cave. He laid down, and he thought, this is it. I'm done. But something happened. Even though it was very dark in there, all of a sudden he saw this faint glimmer of light, and a breeze blew where there was no breeze. And in that moment, he recognized that there was a transformation happening within him that was wakening his soul spiritually to something greater than all that he had put himself through. In that moment, he decided there is something worth living for. And he got up, and he made his way out of the cave. That man was Johnny Cash. And he decided in that moment, this was his rebirth. This was his chance to realign himself with his true spiritual nature, even though he had ignored it for so many years. It was time for him to come back home, to be his authentic self. He re rededicated himself, his life, to his spirituality, to his family, and the rest is history. But that was a turning, uh, a, a, a turning moment for Johnny Cash to recognize and, and follow the instinct that was there. It's like, this is not my time yet. I am not ready to lay this all down. There is more for me to do here. He stumbled his way back into life. Maya Angelou has a great quote. She says, the need for change bulldoze a road down the center of my mind. <laughs> and isn't that the case sometimes? that absolutely sometimes things are stripped away from us. Things are, all of a sudden we feel like we're living the life of Job. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, this isn't what I signed up for. And yet, it's getting us clarity. There's a reason why there are so many stories of how Jesus and other sages walked off into the desert. Because in the desert, there is nothing to distract you. In the desert, there is simply the clarity and the focus for you to come back home to yourself. So this is the moment that we all wait for, to say, wait a minute, this is a transformation that can happen within me, and the change is bulldozing a center right down the, ro ro the road of my mind, and I understand that this too is for my highest good. My Angelou certainly knew that. So why do we have so much suffering when change happens? I have left claw marks in relationships that I have left. I have left claw marks in situations that I no longer needed to be in. Anyone with me on that? Where we absolutely knew, oh, why did I wait so long to do that? And so Mary Ann Williamson in the, in the Gift of Change, the book that she wrote called The Gift of Change, tells about how in the olden days when they first started showing movies in theaters, the crowds didn't understand that it was being projected onto the wall, and they would rush up to the wall and feel the wall because they were trying to figure out how the picture was happening on the wall. They didn't understand that the projector was the one that was the source of these images. And Mary Ann Williams says, says, trying to fix our outer world is like trying to change a movie by manipulating the screen. The world as we know it is simply a screen onto which we project our thoughts. Until we change those thoughts, the movie stays the same. So when I'm rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic, which is what we do when we're changing the conditions in our world, what I really should be doing is changing the consciousness that created it. That's what we teach here. That's what we teach 
is that you go to the source of what happened, not the condition. If I want more money, yes, I can go get a different job, but what must I do to heal the consciousness that created that situation in the first place? Ernest Holmes is repeatedly talking about that in our textbook. He says, change the consciousness and the false condition will disappear. The other great part of that is when you change the consciousness, you don't have to deal with that ever again. You might have to maybe go in a little bit layer in the deeper, uh, deeper layers, but you are, you're going to the source of what caused that. You're going to the movie projector, not the wall. Does that make sense? So you and I have the opportunity to make the changes at the really deep, deep levels here. Ernest Holmes is always talking in the, in the textbook about a trained mind is far more precious than an untrained mind. And what he's talking about there is that when we train our minds, and that's what we go to classes here for, when we train our minds and our thoughts, that's where change really happens. It's not the outer stuff. The outer is simply the embodiment of what happens after you change here. So the thoughts are the beginning of that. He, he says later in Science of Mind, on page 276, we should daily train our thought to recognize the spirit in everything we do, say, or think. He doesn't say a few things, or the ones that are comfortable. In everything, in everything that we do say or think. When I'm recognizing that spirit is in the midst of transformation in my life, even if it's a little uncomfortable, even if it's a little challenging, even if it might be a little painful, I know that there is something good on the other side that allows me to embody that which I am integrating within my very soul. Many of you in this room are in the same process. You are in the midst of integrating something in your life that is important because we chose, here, we chose to come here to be true light bearers. If you're in this room, if you're hearing the sound of my voice, you have chosen to be a light bearer in this world. And so it, it is incumbent upon us to be as clear a light as we possibly can be, would you agree? And wipe away whatever dirt and fog and things that we've put on ourselves and let it go and be our true authentic light. That's what I want to be. So change is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Until we train our thoughts, the way that we learn is called trial and error. <laughs> That's the, my 20s and 30s in dating. <laughs> well, that didn't work. <laughs> Let me try this. Because when you don't have good role models, sometimes you have to just go try something, and if it doesn't work, you learn. That's a very painful way to live sometimes. So a trained mind is able to understand how, what we're here and how everything is for our highest good. I have, I'm going to close with a reading. Some of you might have heard this. It was actually written in 1895 by uh, a gentleman by the name of Joseph Mallins. It's called The Ambulance Down in the Valley. John Denver, the entertainer, would, he would actually recite this by heart at some of his concerts, and you can go online and see videos of him doing that. It talks about how we need to go to the source of what we're here to heal and do. And it goes like this. "'Twas a dangerous cliff, as they freely confessed, though to walk near its crest was so pleasant, but over its terrible edge there had slipped a duke and full many a peasant." The people said something would have to be done, but their projects did not at all tally. Some said, put a fence round the edge of the cliff, others an ambulance down in the valley. The lament of the crowd was profound and loud, as their hearts overflowed with their pity, but the cry for the ambulance carried the day as it spread through the neighboring city. A collection was made to accumulate aid, and the dwellers in highway and alley gave dollars or cents, not to furnish a fence, but an ambulance down in the valley. For the cliff is all right if you're careful, they said, and if folks ever slip and are dropping, it isn't the slipping that hurts them so much as the shock down below when they're stopping. <laughs> so for years we have heard, as these mishaps occurred, quick forth with the rescuer Sally to pick up the victims who fell from the cliff with the ambulance down in the valley. 
said one to his peers, it's a marvel to me that you'd give so much greater attention to repairing results than to curing the cause. You had much better aim at prevention. For the mischief, of course, it should be stopped at its source. Come neighbors and friends, let us rally. It is far better sense to rely on a fence than an ambulance down in the valley. He's wrong in his head, the majority said. He would end all our end earnest endeavor. He's a man who would shirk his responsible work, but we will support it forever. Aren't we picking up all just as fast as they fall and carrying them all liberally? A super superfluous fence is of no consequence if the ambulance works in the valley. The story looks queer as we've written it here, but things oft occur that are stranger. More humane, we assert, than to succor the hurt is the plan of removing the danger. The best possible course is to safeguard the source, attend to things rationally. Yes, build up the fence and let us dispense with the ambulance down in the valley. Isn't that great? <laughs> How many times in my life have I ignored putting a fence up and just let myself slip down and had to pick up myself the pieces at the, in the valley? You and I have a choice. Unlike the dragonfly pulling himself out of the, the river, the pond, whatever he's living in, we are at choice. Let's use our trained thinking by attending classes here, by, by being with others of like mind who will support us in the truth of who we are, and knowing that as we make better choices, our lives have to be better. And we can know that that fence is stopping us from falling down into the valley because we're dispensing with that ambulance. We are here to make a difference by changing our consciousness, which changes the world. Are you with me? Yeah. A few of you are. Yes. 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 Let's go out and make this world a fantastic place. I love you all. Namaste. Hi. I'm Barbara Waterhouse. And I'm John Waterhouse. Thank you for watching this message today. Through our website, cslashville.org, we have over a thousand messages, classes, and new thought books, all to download at no charge to anyone. Producing this incredibly valuable collection of ideas is really making a difference in the world. It's changing lives everywhere. Please go to our website, cslashville.org, and click the Donate button. You can support this life-changing ministry, and when you do, we'll send you a note of thanks and also put you on our daily prayers. By doing this, you're helping to raise the consciousness of people across the entire globe. We're changing lives together, those lives that are being more prosperous, more healthy, and more joyous. Thank you for being a part of this important work and supporting what we do here at CSL Asheville. Thank you.